All right, go ahead. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Agile Education Marketing's webinar, Storytelling Isn't Just for Bedtime. We are happy to have you all here and are looking forward to a really fun and informative presentation. Um, so before we start the program, I just want to go over a couple housekeeping items. Um, and one thing that's uh, changed from some past webinars we've had is that um, we're going to answer questions as they come in. So um, as Mitch and Sue talk, feel free to ask a question and um, we will interject it into the presentation um, so you can get timely answers to your questions this time around. Um, so you'll use the chat or the uh, questions box over on your control panel. So just type the question in there, hit send, and um, we will work it into the program. Um, we'll also be providing a recording of the webinar, so keep an eye on your inbox tomorrow. Um, we'll send you a link for that. It'll be posted on the Agile website, so you're also welcome to navigate to the webinar section there on the website and um, listen to the recording and feel free to share it with anybody else um, that you think might be interested. If you've got any technical difficulties um, during the presentation, please use that questions box again and I'll do my best to um, resolve them for you. So I think we're ready to get started now, and I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers. Uh, Sue Hansen is principal of PR with Panache. She and her team work with many education businesses, probably some of you here on the line with us, to put them center stage with prospective customers. PR with Panache is known for their creative thinking and innovative approach to PR and marketing, some of which you'll hear about today during this webinar. Sue is joined by Mitch Weisberg, who is a partner with Academic Business Advisors, Mitch has a broad range of experience that includes designing, developing, launching, and managing an online learning management system and SAT prep course for collegepilot.com. Mitch currently puts his expertise to work to help companies develop robust, sustainable, well-crafted technology courseware. So we are excited to have both Sue and Mitch with us today, and I'm going to turn the program over to Mitch. And um, again, if you've got questions at any time, feel free to send them. Well, thank you. And actually, uh, Sue, I thought it'd be great if you could set the stage a little bit about uh, storytelling and wh why, why should people care about telling a story and what effect does it have? Sure. Thanks, Mitch. Well, you know, as we all know, there's many different ways to tell a story, and that's what we thought we'd talk about today is the impact of the story, what needs to go into the story, and our title reflects, you know, it's not just for bedtime anymore because stories really are our best avenue for success. Um, I just want to ask everybody, just take a second now, and I want you to recall one of your favorite stories. Or, you know, maybe a story that was told to you, uh, or read to you, maybe it was a marketing piece that came in the mail, maybe you watched a video, or you can recall one of the infamous Hallmark commercials. And just think about what they all have in common. And if you were, were able to recall something, it means they were all memorable. And that's really what we want to help you do today, is to think about how you, your company, your products, your customers, your folks out in the field, how you can make what they do memorable. Um, you know, if we recall something, it's because it was important to us. And we want your customers to remember you and to recall the messages that they received from you. So if you can identify with the message, if you were the right audience for the story, and the story had an effect on you, you're going to go back to that when you need something that they have to offer. And another thing we have to remember and we want to talk about is the listening aspect of the story. Listening is almost just as important as the telling. We need to make sure the folks we're telling our story to are prepared to hear what we have to say. You know, is the message clear enough so that they get it the first time, second time, third time, fifth time? We need to figure that out. Um, you know, what about the voice that that story you recalled was in? You know, that's the written word or the spoken word. You know, what was that delivery? Do you remember it? Do you remember colors? Do you remember pictures? Um, I remember back when I was in the classroom and my students would come up and put something to me, I would just look at them and say, you know, Maybe if you put that in a different way, I might have a different reaction. So it meant, and they understood, the way you're telling your story to me right now 
you're probably not going to get the answer you want. But if you rephrase, if you change your body language, if you change your vocabulary, whatever it needs to be, try that before you come to me because you might get the answer you want. So presentation is critical and we today want to talk about setting the stage so that your delivery evokes whatever you want it to evoke and that you're right on target. And you know, we all have a story to tell, our companies have a story to tell, and no matter what medium we use, whether it be digital, social, video, it needs to be in an authentic voice that resonates with your leader or your, or your listener or your reader. So during this webinar, we just want to share some tips with you so that your company story and your company products will be memorable. So now the stage is set. Take it away, Mitch. Well, I was going to say, I, I actually have a personal story about, about storytelling. And it, it's, it's from, well, many, many years ago, I took a Dale Carnegie course at, on sales. And they, they described how important it was to tell stories in order to uh, increase sales and to, to close sales. And one of the techniques that they use is, is to always begin your story with picture this and then describe something that, that you know, you, you want your prospect to um, to feel, and then and then picture, but and then now picture this, which is something that you don't want them to feel. And I, I always like learning new things. So I came home that night and I said to my to my wife, "Wow, I just learned this this really great technique." And I described it to her. And so she she turns around and she looks at me. She says, "Well, picture this: you're going to bed tonight, and you get into your bed, and your wife is really really happy to see you. So she welcomes you with open arms because you've taken the garbage out." Now picture this. You're going to bed tonight, and when you hop into bed, your wife pulls away all the covers and takes them all because she's really angry because you didn't take out the garbage again. <laughs> now which of those do you want to happen tonight? So I just had to bow to somebody who is a much better t storyteller um, than I'll ever be. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so, well, then you know, just, just coming back to uh, to to storytelling and trying to find out a little bit more about you all who are attending, um, we'd like you to take a, um, we'd like to find out a little bit more about you and, you know, how you're using social networking. So um, I wonder if Emily and Suzanne, if you could put up our first poll. And the first poll is going to ask you, um, how much do you use social networking today? And we'll give you, um, I don't know, you know, 15, 20 seconds, it's, it's a pretty simple question. So let, 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 let's see how many of you are using social networking and how often. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. So. Oh, wow. Okay, Mitch. So now that we're looking at this and we really had no idea what to expect, what do you think these numbers are showing us here? Well, so you know, it looks like there's there's a wide variety of of experience, and I think that for um, those of you who never use social networking or use it less than half an hour a week, um, we're going to describe the different ways that you could use social networking in your business. And for those of you who currently are using it, hopefully during this this webinar, we're going to give you some tips so that you can fine tune the, what you're doing in order to make it more effective and to fit in with your total uh, sales and marketing strategy. And then, um, but, but that, that gives us good information to, to work on it. We have um, another question, which is um, a question relating to who are you trying to reach in, in terms of selling and in terms of the way you're using marketing and social networking? So in this one, you can select more than, than one choice because, you know, you may want to reach uh, school leaders and teachers, for example, um, or you may be going after all five of these groups. So again, we'll give you a, a few seconds. Uh, Sue, why don't you sing this, song, this time? Oh, boy. I don't know. <laughs> Whoa. Nice. So, so this is interesting. Sue, so what do you think that, that, you know, how does this relate to, um, you know, these different audiences relate to what, you know, how people should be uh, focusing where they tell their stories and what media they use? 
Well, you know, that's, that's probably one of the key questions and, you know, you can have the same story, but we need to target it for each of these different audiences because you certainly want your message to resonate with a district administrator um, because they've got, you know, an entire district that they're servicing. They've got different needs. They're going to be focused on different things. So if you have a solution, you need to make sure your story resonates with them. You know, if, if, you, need, and if you need to reach teachers and you want them to be evangelists for you, you've got to understand and do your homework on what's going on in their classroom and why you're the group that is the best solution provider. So, you know, that's a key part of storytelling is you've got to, and you have to make sure that all of these different audiences are ready to hear your message. So that's an art in itself, to make sure that you've teed things up and that you've got yourself in a good position and that they're in a good position. You know, the first time they hear about your new product, remember, it's a first time. So what would you want a first time? Do you want, you know, a piece of paper that is so full of content it's just overwhelming? Or do you want something that is bulleted and a little more clear? Um, do you want a video where you, you can actually listen and see and you can see it 24-7? So this is a big part of being successful in your outreach and your sales and marketing is to make sure you know who your target audience is, but then knowing that your message is also targeted. Now, these, these may be the people that you're that you're targeting, we're also interested to see who you're following and whether you, you know, whose blogs are you reading, um, where are you getting your information about the marketplace. We have, so we have one more poll here, um, and I promise that this is the last one. <laughs> so in social networking, which includes reading blogs, uh, it doesn't even have to be electronic social networking, it could be reading articles. Um, which groups do you follow or listen to? Hmm. Hmm. Look at how they're different. Right. Wow. It, and it's it's very interesting how um, you know the educational thought leaders are the ones who are you know basically a lot of people listen to and yet you know they're decision influencers but they're not decision makers um, and really the, the the people who make the decisions to buy your district admis administrators and school leaders um, and, and teachers seem to be very very vocal as, as well um, I mean one of the one of the main points in social networking is that it's a conversation so that if you're reaching people through the various the various media, in social networking, it's not just broadcasting. It's also listening to what they're saying and getting these different people into dialogue. So that should be one of the things that you're looking to do with social networking is the same people that you're trying to target, find out where they write and what they do, and being able to listen to them and interact with them. Um, Sue? Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and you know, I, I follow, too. I mean, if I were to have filled this out, of course, I'm on the business end. But, you know, I love to follow the education thought leaders. But when I'm working for my clients, you know, depending on what they've got and where their solution goes, you know, I weigh in on all of these. So I think another thing, Mitch, maybe that we should mention is because there's so much to do in social networking to be effective. How to right. manage that time? I mean, how to manage making sure that you're, you know, following everything that's critical, that you've got the right information to share with your customers. You know, you don't want folks to get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So, Emily and Suzanne, if we can come back to the presentation a minute. Um, okay, so... Um, or Emily, was there a, was there a question that you wanted us to um, to address? Uh, 
Okay. Because uh, I thought I saw a, a, a comment. But um, so, any so Sue, so can you just give an example of what a good story of a of a good story? Sure. You know, over the years, I have a million of good, you know, million stories. But one that really just was so spectacular was um, about a, a principal down in Texas, and before he became a principal of, of this school, he was one of the very first students to graduate from Raymond High School in 1998. So he had lived through that high school, saw the challenges, and it was his goal to go back and become a principal there. And he was determined to tackle the high percentage of dropouts um, of students there and really provide the college readiness that they needed. And so he had heard a story from a vendor that was talking about um, you know, what they did to prepare students for college and that they have really had a lot of focus in working with the Hispanic population. And they had a message that really resonated with him. And, and you know, that's a, that's a niche message, but he remembered it. And he was working with many first-generation Hispanic students. So he had that issue. He needed a solution. He heard and remembered the story from my client. It resonated with him because it was relevant. And because the story was so impactful on many different levels, we were able to use that story in a variety of different ways. So parents were extremely interested in this story. It, it engaged the parents because now they had a school leader that was really going to be engaged. He had lived through that. So the parents were very interested. The local media was very interested um, because of what he was bringing back, of course, to his hometown. The national media was very interested because it was a great story had that human impact, yet he could, you know, he had data, he had statistics, he had percentages, you know, all of that kind of information that certain people want to hear, but he also had that human side. Uh, the local radio, of course, was very interested, and all of his peers were very interested. So we were able to use that story to share um, with other principals, and of course, it really benefited my client. They were part of that story, but the story, of course, was not about them. It was about the principal. So that was a golden nugget, you know, and, and it was a great, I wish I had those stories 10 times a day. Um, but it's what we did with that story and how we tailored it to make sure that, you know, each one of the media outlets uh, could hear the story in the right way. and. You know, it became very easy, very viral. Um, he did not create a video. We did not have a video, but he, we put that all over the place. And you know, we wanted to elevate him, and we did. So it was a great story for him and his hometown. And you know, that's what you want, and that's what you need to figure out in everything that you do. My client was able to put their story in a way that it resonated with him, he remembered it, and he put it into action. And that's really what, you, what you we're trying to do with stories. Right, that's it. You know, that's it. So, you know, it's, I always take a look at things simply. You know, we have a very complicated, uh, very busy, very noisy world out there. And I think sometimes people get in their own way by making things really busy or, you know, they just get in their own way. So if you look at things simply, that doesn't mean you're looking at them stupid. You're just looking at them simply. And then you can lay it out so that the next person can see how you've laid that out. It's easy to grasp. You're, you're much better off and they'll remember that story. So. Everything might be simple, but you turn it into smart, and then you get the goal that you wanted. People sometimes ask us if there's a template. You know, can, I, can you just give me the formula? Kind of like the way we do with kids, and we say, oh, you're going to write a five-paragraph essay, um, and, um, and that's that. But I think you know, we, we both find is that there is, there's not one story template. You know, it, it's very much dependent on what media you're going to use who you're going to, to reach, what, what the elements of the story are. Um, I think it's clear that you know, every story 
has to you know begin with the end of mo in mind. You know you have to have a point that you're trying to make, and every story has a a beginning and a middle and an end. Um, but the actual questions that that you want answered are going to be different for each story. I think that um, as we were working to put together um, this this webinar, you know, we worked out like here is an example of a type of template that can get you started writing your stories, uh, where you start off, well, what, what would have happened if we'd done nothing? What was the situation before? Um, what made us decide to get moving in the direction that we did? Um, how did we get started? Uh, what changes have we seen and what results have we achieved? And what are going to be the next steps? And I think that this is one way that as you think about your own products and your and your own customers that you can help your customers put together stories about your products that um, that will that will resonate with uh, prospective buyers uh, Sue, additional comments no yeah no I think that you know like you said there's many templates I just of course and I don't want to sound like a broken record but when you're looking at all of these, just remember who is your audience and tailor those messages to them. Uh, we do have a question that came in, and it's, um, it's about how, how do you uncover within your organization good stories? I think a lot of times when we think about PR and storytelling, it revolves around a new product or a new product feature, um, but, but what if that you don't have that all the time. How do you how do you really find stories within your organization? Mitch, you want me to start or take yeah, it a little ahead. bit? Go ahead. Go ahead. You know that's that's a very good question because I hear that often from clients, and one of the biggest things I think is how you ask questions and how you listen, um, because I've said so many times. Is there somebody out in the field that could help us? You know, is there a practitioner that's using your product or you know something that we could talk to and see what's going on? And you hear no, they're not doing anything that interesting or this and that. And we just keep talking. And so if you pull and pull and pull, and all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, we've got so much here that we can turn into a very compelling story. But a company sometimes, you know, it's like you can't see the forest for the trees because you live it. And so sometimes you need that outside person or, you know, a fresh set of eyes and ears. But I find that listening is really critical. And once you get somebody who's willing to just talk, um, it will help. But always talking to folks out in the field, you will get a million stories and then you just have to decide how that story fits into a, a larger trend, how that story would help complement something that one of our great media partners is putting together, but it just takes the right questions and the right listening, I think, is one, one way to help that. And, and I was, you know, as, as, you were, as you were talking and I was thinking about the question also, I was thinking, you know, stories about new features those are the worst type of stories. I mean, I, you know, for, for me, I don't care what your new features are, okay? Mm -hmm. But what I care about, because if, if you go one level behind the new feature, what was the problem that people were having that made you put this new feature in? Right. And, right. Then, if you, and then if you talk about these problems and how they affected you, how they affected the, the, the teachers, how they affected the students, how they affected the schools, and how you came up with the idea of, of that this new feature was going to help and what you expect to happen. I mean, there is a perspective story. If you, if you can turn that into, instead of just what you think will happen, if you can then relate that to what actually did happen with a customer when that customer started using that feature, well, then it turns into not just a story, um, but but a lot more powerful because it's based on something that's actually happened. Yes, you know, have another. Oops, go ahead, Sue. Um, well, we I do don't have know. another question that came in. So okay, go ahead. No, I don't want you know. Ask the, the question. Okay, um, and I, I think this is a real good one, and I'm going to quote some from it. <laughs> um, 
So the specific question is, do you really tell stories in press releases? So I think we all think of the typical press release format as, and this is the quote, company name, the largest XYZ in the world, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> or do you start, you know, can, how do you start a press release with a more compelling story from the practitioner or the field? You know, that is a good question because a press release is a snippet. You know, my belief is a press release cannot tell your whole story. That press release, folks will probably read the, the headline, maybe the subheadline, and maybe a little bit of the first paragraph. And it really needs to highlight who the story is about, not the company. And again, the company plays a role, but in order for somebody to say, ooh, that's interesting to me, they have to be able to identify it or identify with it. So if by chance a superintendent sees this press release come out in one of the publications and all he sees is company X, like you said, biggest this and this, makes this happen, he wouldn't look at it a second time. But if he sees district so-and-so is doing such and such and it advanced students or whatever, and then the company name may be in the subheadline, you know, that, that they help support it. But that's what will make people take a look at that, is if it's of interest to them. And basically, the vendor is not of interest. You know, a vendor is a tool. And they want to know who's done something that they respect and somebody, you know, peer-to-peer. -peer. So, yeah, press releases, and, and, you know, I think we go round and round with it. They're invaluable. I love them still. I love, of course you know, online, offline, but that's where your website, and, and I know I'm jumping around, but that's where your website then becomes really important because that press release should provide just enough tidbit and just enough interest to say, hmm, that district did this or that teacher did that or this special ed group was able to accomplish that. I want that for my staff. I want that for my kids. Let me go and read about this. And then they go to your website. I think that actually segues into a, into a few different things because we'll we'll go into later on you know how these different media support each other. But you know I, th I think this also goes into well what's the purpose of of, a, of the story, and um, and that's actually surprise surprise on the next slide. <laughs> and Mitch is right. There's different purposes for your story and you know you need to set expectations that needs to be a, an internal discussion with your marketing your PR your sales everybody's on the same page so you know what you're using to build brand awareness what are you doing to generate leads and what are you doing in the social world to prove that you're effective and you know brand awareness is key 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 I mean, it's, it's golden. If you've got strong branding, you know, that lets everybody know a, a clear understanding of your organization's focus and what your unique impact is. So here's where you have to differentiate, differentiate, differentiate. You know, you hopefully have a product that is outstanding. And you need to not just say it's outstanding. You need to say why it's outstanding. So when you're doing some some strong branding strategy you know think of your best practices and your concept should be of your organizational personality um, and you know I think we used to call that tone or image but everything really is about personality it's what's memorable again what are you drawn to you know many times you buy a car from the person I mean you've got a million people you could buy the same car from but you go back to this dealership because that person took a general interest in you, and that's the same in our market. You know, a lot of us are, are vying for the same pots of money, and so you want them to come to you to buy the product. So, um, you know, the, the branding is, is critical. Um, and whether you're going then for lead gen, you know, there's many tools you can select from and to get your message out there and to get your story, you know, whether you use direct mail, uh, social media, email, telemarketing, events, you just need to create a real value for your machine. You, you need to create a value machine for you so that when you want to compel somebody 
to come to your booth at a at a trade show or whatever uh, you know what have you done to compel them to go what have you done to help get that lead to come and then of course what are you doing to turn that lead into a buyer you know I think the days are way over of you know you build it and they will come um, it isn't that way in there huh if they were ever here if yeah. there ever was yeah. a time when if you build True. it they will come and you know that's where where blogs and a video series you know things that will help you drive people so that they want to find out more um, but you don't just want to generate any lead you know you want to generate a lead that's going to go into sales so you've got to be really smart about how you put your company story or your product story or your customer story on those lead generating uh, materials so Mitch what do you think about the social proof part well actually what I was going to go is that people probably already gathered that you know, when you and I work together on um, on clients, you're primarily the face-to-face -face person, and I'm and the press person, and I'm kind of the social media person. Yep. And it's kind of our this, these complementary schools is what makes us effective. On the social media side, you know, surveys show that the the five main sales benefits of social media marketing are customer engagement, direct customer communications speed in which you can get feedback, uh, learning about customer preferences, and brand building. Now note that uh, lead generation was not part of that. So you know if you're um, if you're looking at your social media in order to build leads, that's really the wrong media for lead generation. It's all these other things that you do that build build leads. Your social media can help you with your brand awareness. It can inform your 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 product development. Um, it can, through your your blogs and your website, provide a way for people to find out more about you, to find out how to use your products, how other people are using your products, and how they and how other people like your products. It can increase brand awareness. It can create customer loyalty. Okay, but it's generally not going to generate a lot of leads, and social media is not going to close a lot of a lot of sales. Um, there's kind of a, a saying that the social web isn't for doing business, it's for making friends. But if you think about what the way you buy, I mean you you generally buy from people that you like. So you see that connection exists between getting people to like you through social media and preparing for them to buy from you. It's not a direct link, it's more of an indirect link between using social media and increasing sales. Yep. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Okay, and you know, here we go into the different ways and media you can tell your story. Sue, so why don't you why don't you start? You know, I, I am a real face-to-face, uh, -face. I love relationships, I love talking, I love laughing, um, and I really like that. And conferences still provide so many opportunities. Now, I'm not saying that you, you know, I mean, that's your conference strategy, you have to figure that out. But if you, do, if you are at a conference, um, you know, you've got so many opportunities to drive people to a booth if you're going to have a booth. You have so many good people you could have in your booth that can talk and tell your story. Um, I mean, that's just the old age old adage, I won't go through it, but when you see, you know, the middle aged white chubby man sitting on a chair, uh, you know, with his sturdy shoes on and he doesn't get up and come and say hello, he doesn't greet you, you know, that's not the way you want your story told. So. And the conferences are just a way for you to pull together, have special events, you know, drive new customers, meet with your old customers, meet with current customers. And I, for one, am really in favor of having a branded event, if at all possible. And a branded event does not mean you have to invite hundreds and hundreds of people. We've had some great success, or my clients have, by hosting small, intimate, breakfasts, intimate, um, lunch and learns, whatever, around conferences where like-minded people are already gathered. So they're already there. So why not 
treat them, show them that, you have, that they're important to you, and then have them come for breakfast. Um, many of my clients have had such success in the media suites that we host at some of the key educational conferences. Um, also, something that we've done over the years at these conferences is in, in uh, my clients and I host what we call a martini matinee. And that has become just an outstanding branded event. Um, and we differentiated it, you know. We serve only martinis. So people have lots of choices, lots of places to go um, when they're at a conference. And, and, you know, they have to make many decisions. But we tried to differentiate it so my clients would have key people come and have some face-to-face, -face, some social time. Um, business isn't necessarily discussed, but relationships are building. And yet I've had clients walk away from those events saying, Sue, I can't tell you how many hundreds of thousands of dollars of business that probably will come to fruition because of this martini. <laughs> so, you know, I just think if you think outside the box a little bit, that you can make some very differentiated things um, for your company. And, you know, the press networking, I love, I love our media partner friends that we have in our industry. I mean, you know, everybody says, uh, and I remember this back in the early 90s, um, Dean Kephart at Connors Communications was my boss, and Dean was also my debate partner in college. So now I was taking direction from my debate partner. But he said, Sue, this industry is so different than the industry you're coming from. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? Of course, he was right. And I find myself saying the same thing to anybody who's new in the industry, that, you know, we are our own little family, our own little niche. You need to learn the language, all of that. So when you're working with the press, you have to make sure that what you have is in the language that their readers want to hear. You know, they want to help their readers learn new things. They want to help their readers uh, know what's going on in the world. So when we talk about articles that we would like them to help us um, get out there or you know run a press release or something, we have to be real careful that we make sure it brings value to their readership. Um, and again, they're invaluable. Press network, you know, our relationships with the press are invaluable. And um, I, I think I don't want anybody ever to say that, you know, working directly with the media never works. It, it is what works. So I, I just think that those things are absolutely necessary. And Mitch, I know now you're going to talk about social networking and, and, you know, how you can use that to help tell the story because all of this is real interwoven. Okay. And what we've listed here is uh, some of the different so more general social networking sites. Um, we didn't even go into the special sites uh, such as uh, site, um, sites such as EdWeb, which are teachers only, and those can be used very effectively also. But you know, just looking at these these different groupings, um, your website is is what you're primarily using for sales support. It's where you show what your products do, how to buy where you have demos, where you have testimonials, where you have proof of efficacy, white papers, and where you have calls to action. Your website is what you're primarily using to sell. Uh, your blogs, is blogs are used for a different purpose. Blogs are really bi-directional. So on your blog, this is, this is a place where you demonstrate that you're knowledgeable and that you care about the industry. It's not primarily sales. Although perhaps you know on, on any page a quarter of the space could be spent on certain types of calls to action, but most most of your blog is going to be where you're talking about topics that are interesting to the people who will either use or purchase your products. Um, we do blogging a lot. We have a blog at academicbiz.typepad.com, and our main audience is actually education technology companies. Uh, so we tend to write about various ed tech topics that we think are going to interest ed education technology companies. And every once in a while we sprinkle in some personal news and, and, 
every once in a while we sprinkle in some news about about clients you know as examples of what we do but the main purpose of the blog is to talk about uh, things that are interesting to the people who will be using your product not not to sell them but the other side of the blogs is the blogs that you read and comment on so that list that, that we talked about before of who your target audiences are and who you listen to you should be finding blogs that somewhat resemble the types of people that you want to sell to or the types of people that that um, that will influence those, those sales or use your products and you should get conversations going with the people who write those blogs if you read those blogs first of all you're going to find out what those people are mostly interested in if you comment on those blogs and especially if you write comments that link back to articles on your blog you're going to be driving traffic to your blog if you comment about those blogs on your blog well then the authors of those other of those blogs that you comment on are going to um, end up reciprocating and comment on your blogs and drive even more traffic to to your blog and, and your website so you should think about blogs not just in terms of gee I'm going to write a blog but also in terms of what are the blogs that my constituents are are are, are writing and how can I interact with them? You, hey, Mitch, you, um, just yes? real quick, um, we had a couple people ask if you could repeat that blog address that you mentioned just a minute ago. Okay, so our blog is uh, http colon slash slash academicbiz, A-C-A-D-E-M-I-C-B-I-Z dot typepad dot com. Academicbiz dot typepad dot com is, is where the blog is. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, well, thanks for asking. <laughs> and um, so, so the next, the next up was was newsletter. Okay, your newsletter, and we're talking primarily about emailed newsletters. Um, that's where you're going to tell what's new. You're going to summarize and link to any blog articles that you post. You're going to tell people what conferences you're going to be at. You're going to talk about case studies about customers. Not necessarily the full case study, but you might, in a, in a newsletter, you might have a paragraph to say, well, here is how such and such a school really improved their reading, if, if, if you have a reading product. Or here's how such and such a school, uh, school's special education students really um, made tremendous progress in, in, in fourth grade. And half of another sentence, and then a link that says more, so, so that um, so it doesn't take too much room on your newsletter, and the people who are really interested can um, can the, go to your your website or blog where you have a longer longer article. Um, in your newsletter, you're going to have a, a a series of calls to action, something like you know for this month only do this, um, or uh, in your newsletter you might ask your readers and readers like to interact with newsletters. So you might ask your readers to vote on two descriptions of a product to see which would be more likely to sell. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of news, a lot of email newsletters, and, is, and if you want to see a good example of, of, a, of a newsletter, I think Atomic Learning, um, and if you go to their site, you can sign up for the newsletter. I think they have a great example of, of, of a newsletter. They often talk about some, how some new content is helping teachers overcome some timely issue, uh, like mobile learning or Common Core, and then a link back to their website where they describe it more often. And then um, Pinterest and uh, Symbaloo are two places for you to curate and share resources with the community. Um, I keep track of resources that free resources that can be used in, you know, with interactive whiteboards or for reading or for math. And it's amazing how often you know, somebody on Twitter or um, some other uh, social network a asks, well, gee, I'm looking for something that can do such and such in my class. And by giving, you know, an answer, uh, I, I'm, I'm establishing a, a level of trust with those people who have, who have the, the same, the same um, issues. And Pinterest and Symbaloo are, are two excellent products for that. And Twitter, um, well, t Twitter is, is interesting because, from from my standpoint, 
Twitter really has three purposes. Um, it's another way to communicate what you do. So if you're, if you're doing a webinar, for example, um, you tweet it. If, um, <coughs> if you've um, done a new blog entry, you tweet that you've done a new blog entry. Uh, so that's the first use, it's to communicate what you're doing. Uh, second, it allows you to see and hear what others are saying in your market, um, as, especially if you're following the education topics like EdChat or um, EdTech or EdReform. Um, and third, uh, when you retweet and follow what others are doing, they're more likely to reciprocate and drive traffic to your properties. So. So those are really, for me, the three purposes of Twitter. One is to communicate what you're doing. Two, allows you to hear and what, what other people are saying. And three, allows you to drive traffic by engaging in a dialogue with other people in, in your industry. Um, just in terms of Twitter, I've heard one rule of thumb is that you should, and if you, should retweet about, you should tweet about four times a day. Three quarters of that should be interesting information for the community, and about one quarter of that can be really kind of naked sales tweets like, hey, we're having a special or, um, or here's a new feature of our product. But, um, but keep the ratio um, as by far the, 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 the majority of your tweets should be informational and a minor minority should be um, sales oriented. Uh, and then we go to the, the, the final thing on this list, which is webinars. And hey, Sue, isn't that what we're doing here? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, a webinar helps establish you as an expert, hopefully makes the listener want to contact you for further, for further help or information. You can use the archived content of the, of the webinar to supplement your blog or your website. It gives you something to tweet about and put in your newsletter. Um, and you can tweet about it and put it in your newsletter both before the webinar to invite people to attend and after the webinar to invite people to, to take a look at the archive. Um, and hopefully it drives, it, it, it establishes you as, as, a, as an expert in an area and makes people want to find out more and, and contact you later, which we hope you all will do with us. So that's kind of a rundown of five of the more popular ways of using social networking. So we have other one comments? question. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, we did have a question um, just about LinkedIn. It's not on that list, and how do you see that playing a role here in the education market? So, um, I, well, it probably it probably could have been. Um, n not all that many teachers or superintendents use LinkedIn. So there are some who do, and there are a couple groups who do. Um, it's very valuable for for us because a lot of the um, business people in education use LinkedIn, and there are there are a lot of groups. So if you're interested in post secondary, there's a group called Educause, which is um, which has a lot of post secondary discussions. Um, EdNet has its, has its own group. Uh, there's there's some entrepreneurial education groups. So so we find that we're mostly talking to business people who are in education, not so much, um, not so much uh, educators themselves, although ISTE uh, does have a very active group. And so if you're interested in technology coordinators uh, within schools, that's a, that's a good group on LinkedIn to, um, to belong to. Does that, uh, uh, I think that, oh. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're doing great, Mitch, I love it. Okay. And we actually had a similar question about Facebook, um, since that wasn't on the list, and, and using that in, for social networking as well. Well, so do you want do you um, do you want me to take it, or do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So I don't I don't want to monopolize people's time, but um, so it, it's interesting with Facebook. I I I do use Facebook. I don't use it very often for business, and. Um, and I've looked at a lot of the Facebook pages of education companies, and I think that it's really much more effective with a consumer sale than with an education sale. I haven't yet seen an education campaign on Facebook that's really established a company as a leader or, um, or resulted in sales. So um, for me, in education, I would say, you know, um, 
don't look for a tremendous amount of results on Facebook. Um, although, you know, I, I, I could end up being wrong. But as as of right now, I haven't I haven't seen any really great uses of Facebook for education business. I, you know, I'd rather okay. go to something like EdWeb. Yeah, I think when you sit and have the opportunity to talk with administrators um, and ask them where they go to receive their information and where they go, you know, to learn about new things that are out there, um, rarely have I heard Facebook. I mean, most of the time they hardly mention anything social, um, which I'm, I'm surprised at times. But some say you know they're getting more involved in Twitter. But of course, they like to use it more for school closings and you know uh, immediate things. But Facebook, they still, you know, aren't. They, no one has ever told me that they use Facebook to go and receive any critical information. So I agree with everything you just said. We actually had a comment, um, which I think is is pertinent here. Um, do you think that Facebook might be a better fit if you're trying to reach homeschoolers? Yes. Yes, great point. If it, which is it's just kind of a consumer, more of a consumer market. Um, so if you're trying to reach um, parents, and the, one of the keys that you want to look for is is Facebook groups. There, about three years ago, there was a there really was a, a great group called Primary Educators, and that was um, uh, based originally in the UK, but expanded nationwide, and there were mostly teachers in elementary school and that was very active but it died out about about two years ago um, but there are a number of groups and I can't remember the names right now but there are a number of groups for homeschooling parents on Facebook and those would be good groups to belong to again if you go onto those groups and you start talking about I have this product and I have that product they're, they're going to tune you out and they're going to banish you from the group if you start talking about um, the thing, if you start commenting on things that they're bringing up in a non-commercial way, and every once in a while slip in a commercial announcement, people accept that. They know you're they know you're in business, but they first want to see that you're interested in the community, not that you're primarily interested in selling them something. Great. And just one more interjection that came in, um, which I think is pertinent. Um, just some other resources like SchoolTube, TeacherTube, and um, you know there, there are a lot of K-12 focused uh, video and file sharing sites out there. So I think some of what needs to happen is you have to sift through all this and figure out what's the, what's the best channel to tell your story in um, out there. There's right. So we can, those, are, those are certainly possible outlets and I you know what I'd hope is that you know that you sit down with somebody who has experience in all of the, in, in, in a number of those and work out what your priorities are who your audiences are come up with certain stories decide which media you can you can reproduce those stories in and then develop your strategy from there and that's you know the, the overall you know, our overall goal is to is to help you plan what you know what how you what stories you tell, what media you use, and how you tell those stories and to what audiences. Okay. So it's it's I, I'm just looking at the time. It's it, we only have about five or six minutes. Um, so why don't we move on to really well first the next slide. Okay, and you know, so why don't you just briefly talk about you know how people can use videos to tell their story, and and how those videos can be used and reused. Yeah, videos have just become, I think, a lifesaver. You know, they help establish your company personality much quicker than the written word can, and it differentiates you immediately. Um, now. I also re um, would encourage you to put a time and so that people know is this a minute and, and how long is it going because nothing's worse than opening up a video and thinking, okay, I'll watch this and whoa, it's going to be 20 minutes long and that isn't what you had allotted time for. So, you know, that's one thing if you're going to use a video. And, you know, I, the same age-old adage, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Videos are just engaging. People like them. 
um, you can give an explanation of what you're doing. They help. Uh, the video marketing can increase your brand and credibility. Um, you can tell all kinds of stories on there. You know, it can be a story from somebody at the corporation, a story from one of your end users. Uh, for branding and awareness and going viral and posting that video um, is not, it's just fabulous for your story. It can demonstrate, it enhances your website, it shows your expertise, uh, can drive traffic. Um, if you want, sometimes you can use that video to promote a sale or a special event. But it really does engage your customers a bit more with your brand. And I think static websites, you know, are not the way to go anymore. So get your story up. Promote your brand um, through video. Yep. Yeah, I just recently saw a statistic which said something like 40% of all Internet dollars are going into video. Really? Um, yeah. It, well, part of that is because videos are more expensive to produce right than almost you know any other media. But um, but that's not a bad thing to know as as you as you plan your your web strategy. And I think you know this slide here talks about you know have having the different communication support your story. But if we go just to the next slide, because I know we're we're also running out of time, but this that illustrates it more graphically that. You know, we, if you start with a story, and that story um, becomes, you know, background for an article that's going to support some edi editorial calendar, it can be the basis of a blog entry. It can go on the website to sh to show how your product is used, and can be the basis for 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 a video. That it's something that you tweet about so that people know where to find it. Um, that. You summarize it and put that story into your newsletter. You um, you link the blog article or video on your on your Facebook status. You know, um, and um, and if it's something that's really popular, you you can uh, write a uh, schedule a, a webinar around that topic, and then you use LinkedIn to update the edu educational groups that you belong to, like the. Uh, one here that that I think has been valuable, the Educational Sales and Marketing Network, um, you know, to to maintain to maintain interest in LinkedIn, and then you and you do press releases about it. So this is this is an example of, of one way of spinning a story uh, using different media, and it's this is the type of of plan that you would do with any of your stories to figure out how you're going to use it in in the different media where you want to appear. Sue? Yep. I'm looking at the time. I think this is a great slide, and I hope folks take a peek at it after the webinar. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then so why don't we move to the final slide? And you know what? What we hope is that you've you've gotten a lot from this from this hour, and that if you have further questions or if you're interested in seeing how to uh, make your stories resonate and use them in different media that you contact uh, Sue and myself. And uh, the first six who respond uh, will receive a free half-hour consultation with um, PR with Panache and Academic Business Advisors. Sue? Great. Yes. But that's, go ahead, Emily. Well, I was just going to wrap it up and thank you both very much um, for your time and all that information that you shared. And just to reiterate, we are going to have the recording available um, on the Agile website. We'll also post the PowerPoint slides, and we'll send you a link to all of that in an email tomorrow. Um, that email will also include a link to a survey, and we really appreciate you taking just two minutes to answer the questions and provide your feedback, and also give any other suggestions for future webinar topics that you might be interested in. So thank you again, Sue and Mitch. Um, this was really a valuable hour for me, and I think for everyone else. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>